I think you need to understand that the non-invasive diagnosis of arterial disease begins with a good history and physical exam. Um, your history and physical exam direct where you're going to go with non-invasive imaging and thereafter. Um, knowing that a lot of patients present with asymptomatically or atypical leg symptoms, and your job oftentimes is just to rule in or rule out peripheral arterial disease, because I'm sure you've all seen patients in clinic where they're sent to you because they've got leg symptoms and really they, they don't have vascular disease. They have other um, diagnoses like neurogenic claudication. So patients can be asymptomatic in the sense that they have other comorbidities, so they're not challenging their vascular system in terms of eliciting symptoms of claudication. And we all know what claudication means, um, and we know that the symptoms are one level below where you have a lesion. Um, the differential diagnosis, of course, is vascogenic, neurogenic, pseudoclaudication, lumbar disc disease, and other conditions. And it's our job sometimes to rule out or rule in vascular diseases. Um, it's also important to gain the risk factors and comorbidities, but don't forget to ask about contrast allergies, because that can really um, affect further treatment for the patient. Physical exam, you need to do a thorough physical exam. Um, and I'm sure you all know this. Um, Doppler examination is, is, is an extension of our physical exam and is performed in patients with absent pedal pulses, non-healing wounds, and of course those patients with significant edema where you can't even palpate a pulse. Um, don't forget to use the, at the angle of intonation at 60 degrees. If you're at 90 degrees, you may not even hear a signal. It's all that sine and cosine rule. Physiologic testing is really done to confirm the diagnosis and to elicit the level of stenosis or occlusion. So there's multiple testing that we perform, and some of these you will see on your boards. So segmental limb pressures seem to be going out of favor, but we still use them with pulse vol volume recordings. But I'd say more often we use exercise testing, PPGs, and in our institution we use a lot of transcutaneous oxygen measurements to define level of amputation. So ABI is performed for absent pedal pulses, non-healing wounds, exertional leg symptoms, um, and those patients with comorbidities and risk factors for PAD. Um, you need to obtain arm pressures. Um, anyways, um, both the right and left brachial pressures and both the PT and DP pressures use the highest arm pressure and use the highest foot pressure um, which is a little different to how they measure it in medicine. They'll use the lower um, pressure at the ankle. And we, we use the highest level because that really sort of gives you the lowest level of healing. Um, and that didn't work out, but anyways, you know that uh, a normal ABI is greater than one, although if it's greater than 1.3, that's not normal. Um, and then ABI drops according to multiple levels of diseases with um, uh, ABI drop of 0.3 per lesion, so the lower the ABI, the more lesions that you have and the worse your symptoms. Um, we know that ABI correlates with other clinical measures including walking distance, balance, overall physical activity, and that ABI does correlate with coronary artery disease, risk of stroke, progressive renal insufficiency, and all-cause mortality. So the lower the ABI, the greater the risk of death. That being said, the higher the ABI, the same thing in the sense of these patients usually have diabetes or end-stage renal disease. Um, if you have an elevated ABI um, in patients with, non -calcif with calcified vessels and non-compressible vessels, that's when you need to go on to further imaging, and that includes a TBI. But just for your sake, you need to know what a risk brachial index um, is, and knowing that um, a normal risk brachial index is one. So TBIs um, are for patients with calcified vessels, um, and particularly those with diabetes and end-stage renal disease. Um, we know that the pressure between the ankle and the toe should vary about by 30, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury, which is why a normal a TBI is 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. Um, and that an absolute toe pressure can give us a lot of information, so anything less than 30 is a, 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 indicator of poor healing ability. 
So segmental pressures um, are used to determine level and extent of disease, but it is limited in the sense that we can't define occlusion versus stenosis. Um, and it is difficult to interpret when you have multiple levels of disease. Um, this is, there's a three-cuff technique and a four-cuff technique. In our institution, we use a four-cuff technique if we do it anymore. Um, so you have the patients um, lying in the supine position. You measure pressures at the high thigh, above the knee, below the knee, and at the ankle. And what you're looking for is differentials and pressures between the right side and the left side and between levels. So if you have a drop of more than 30 millimeters of mercury, that, that is significant for a lesion on that ipsilateral side. Or if a difference between the right and left is significant for a lesion on, on the contralateral side. Um, the high thigh pressure should be greater than 30 millimeters of mercury, higher than the arm pressure. And then the above knee and below knee about, should be about the same level as the arm pressure. You can do the same thing with the upper extremity, but the, and that allows you to define whether there's a more pro, um, central lesion. So if you have differential arm blood pressures, you know that you have an anominate or subclavian or axillary lesion. And if you have a difference between 10 to 20 millimeters mercury on the same side between different segments, that's also significant for a lesion. Pulse volume recordings are essentially air plethysmography and measures volume changes in the limb. Um, they really aren't used that often, but um, understanding that the waveform should have a normal systolic upstroke with a short systolic peak, followed by the downstroke and the prominent necrotic notch. So this is a classic one. If you can see on the patient's left side, that's essentially normal. On the right side, you can get information both from the pressures as well as the waveforms. And I'm sure everyone knows how to interpret these. Um, digital waveforms are for patients with small vessel disease like Burgers, Raynaud's, and of course diabetes and end stage renal disease. Um, a triphasic signal correlates with a nice um, uh, waveform, and then the, the greater the level of the disease, the more blunting of the waveform. Exercise treadmill testing is classically performed for patients with claudication symptoms but a normal physical exam. So their ABI may be normal, but they really come to you with classic symptoms of claudication. So what you want to do is you want to put them on a treadmill, and there's defined um, algorithms for how you do this for a patient. Um, you have them walk for five minutes, you, uh, and you, uh, you document the duration of the exercise, the onset of symptoms, where they get the symptoms, if they have to stop, and then you measure ABI pre and post exercise. Normal um, pressure should increase with exercise, and your ABI should increase with exercise. However, if you have a fixed lesion, it won't. So you have a drop in ABI greater than 20%, and you have a longer refractory time to um, normalizing your pressure. And this is a nice example of single level disease versus multi level disease. Multi level disease takes longer to normalize than single level, and of course, both of them are longer than normal. Um, transcutaneous oxygen measurements allow you to define the wound healing capability at the level of the toe, the TMA, the ankle, and in some cases, we've done it in BKAs or AKAs in patients. Um, with significant vascular disease. And what you really want to do is, is it helps you guide the level of wound healing. So if you, you, what you don't want to do is a toe amputation in someone with a toe pressure of zero because they're not going to heal it. And if the transmetatarsal pressure is 10, they're not going to heal that either. And if the ankle pressure is 20, they're probably not going to heal that. So you can't just do a toe amputation. You probably have to do a BKA or an AKA. So it really does help you define where your level of amputation is going to be. Um, and so a greater than 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury is a good indicator of healing, and less than 10 is a poor indicator. Ultrasonography we use a lot in our institution, um, and we often operate without um, angiograms based on ultrasonography in the acute setting. It essentially uh, allows you to map the, the level of the stenosis and gives you a lot of information in terms of velocities, velocity ratios, um, and helps you guide your intervention with angiography. So the benefits, obviously, are it's 
non-ionizing radiation. It's portable. It's reproducible. We use it a lot in the operating room to define where we're going to make our incisions. But it is operator dependent, so I would say get used to using an ultrasound for percutaneous access for everything and de defining what your anatomy is before you make an incision on your patient. Um, and, um, and anyways, you have to do it free board, so. Um, it, essentially, um, ultrasonography is used for preoperative evaluation as well as surveillance. We really rely on ultrasonography in our patient for post carotids, post leg bypasses, um, for surveillance. Um, average velocities in the common femoral should be over 100 in the SFA in the 90s, pop chill. 60 to 70s in the tibial 60s. So you can get a lot of information just from velocities um, about level of diseases and um, changes in um, surveillance postoperatively. And then uh, velocity ratios are important. A ratio greater than four is a greater than 75% lesion. So advanced imaging is performed for patients um, uh, that you plan on doing an intervention, particularly if you're going to do angiography because there is risk involved with angiography. So CTA, I think everyone knows the benefits of CTA um, and the limitations in, in the sense that you still need ionizing radiation, IV contrast, the risk of allergy, and then the dreaded complication of contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, MRA, there are two modalities. There's non-contrast with a phase contrast and time of flight, and then there's contrast enhanced with the T1 shortening, shortening effect. Um, recent studies have shown that MRA is more accurate than CTA, although we tend to still use CTA because I think it's cheaper and um, quicker, and patients don't have the, the disadvantage of having to sit in that small tube for a long period of time, especially if they have claustrophobia, and of course patients with pacemakers aren't suitable candidates. And then the dreaded risk, you might see this on the board as well. Um, so um, I think everyone knows about uh, digital subtraction and angiography, the benefits and the limitations, and the risk factors associated with arterial puncture. So just very briefly, the algorithm for an asymptomatic patient, you need to do a you know, good physical exam, get an ABI. ABI less than 0.9 is, is indicator of PAD, greater than 1.3 is small vessel disease. For symptomatic patients, um, this is when you start using other testing, so you exercise testing in patients that have symptoms, but normal exam. 